For my third year of university, I was planning on moving into a large four-bedroom house with the three girls I'd lived with during second year. We'd gotten quite close over the previous two years, and I was more than happy to spend my third and final year with them. But in the last few weeks before summer break, I spotted a sign in the window of a house on my way back from uni, and not just any old house either. This house was on my regular route back from university, meaning that I'd walked past it a hundred times over the previous eight months or so, and if I'm perfectly honest, I was obsessed with it. It sat on the elbow on a crook street that was mostly terraced houses, and it stood out not only because it was detached, but because it has this cozy cottage vibe that appeared refreshingly out of place. It was the kind of house that I could see myself growing into a crazy old cat lady in, and I can assure you, I mean that in the best possible sense. It had a tiny little garden out front, and from the looks of things, an outdoor cat who would let me pet her whenever she was sitting on the wall outside. All in all, it added up to my dream home, so imagine my excitement when I see a room for let sign in the window. I made a note of the email address printed on the small homemade sign and then practically ran back home to write up a first draft. Oh, and I mean first draft. The email said to send over a phone number and a brief introduction, but I think I must have hit about 600 words before I realized that it was getting out of hand. I definitely went overboard in terms of hyping myself up and heaping praise on their home, but I wanted to live there so, so badly, and when the couple who owned the home got back to me, I wanted it even more. They were a lovely husband and wife couple named Jen and Andrew, and the rent that they were asking for was about half what the other landlord wanted for our four-bedroom place. I wouldn't even have to feel bad about backing out of my flatmates, as we'd had a mutual friend who'd jump at the chance to live with them. Once we had all the things hashed out, I moved in as soon as the lease on my old place ran out, and so began about two to three weeks of just absolute bliss. Jen and Andrew were a hard-working, professional, and outgoing couple, meaning I sometimes had the entire house to myself for 13 or 14 hours at a time. That kind of peaceful environment was exactly what I needed for my third and final year of study, and the whole place was decorated so nicely that moving in amounted to a dream come true. I was technically living in their future child's bedroom up in their attic conversion, but they left the decor very neutral, which again was exactly what I needed for long periods of focused study. I still led a fairly active social life, but whereas my old flatmate's place became the party house during the weekend, I had this consistent crib of comfort to come home to whenever I needed some peace and tranquility. It was every student's dream in a way, and at the time, I thought that I was the luckiest girl in the world. But if I'd have known what a slow-drip nightmare that I'd just gotten myself into by moving in, I wouldn't have felt nearly so fortunate. Like I said, living there for the first six weeks or so was a dream. I was given my privacy and treated very respectfully, which I suppose is what made the sudden but subtle change easier to notice. One day, I came home from university and the porch door was closed. Now I always close the porch on my way out, always. Out of respect for Jen and Andrew, I wanted to keep the heat in and save them a few quid on bills. However, on that morning, I slept through my alarm. To get to my first morning lecture, I had to just throw on some clothes, rely on a hat to hide my bedhead, and rush out of the house with just a few dabs of roll-on deodorant and some chewing gum to give the appearance of hygiene. Not my finest hour, but such is life as a student. I knew for a fact that I didn't close the porch door that morning, possibly for the first time since I've been living there. But like I said, when I got back to the house, it was closed. Later that day, I remarked to Jen and Andrew at dinner that one of them had been home that day, and both denied it. I wasn't confrontational or snarky about it, but I told them someone must have been home because the porch door had been open. Both shrugged it off, told me that no one else had a key, and assured me in the nicest possible way that I must have been mistaken. I was so sure that I wasn't. I mean, 99.9% .9 certain, because if I'd have closed it shut at the speed that I was going... I swear that I'd have shattered one of the door's panes of glass. But then if neither Jen nor Andrew said that they'd been home, there were no signs of forced entry or burglary, the Mimi was nothing to worry about. Now don't get me wrong, I knew for certain someone had been home, I didn't feel that I was going mad or anything, I just didn't see it for the red flag that it was. 
not until it was too late. The point where I properly realized that Andrew wasn't quite the sweet married man that I thought he was, was the run-in I had with him outside the upstairs bathroom. I'll do you the good courtesy of not getting into the nitty gritty of what I was doing in there, but I was in there for a good few minutes. When I finish up, I wash and dry my hands, and then when I open up the bathroom door, there's Andrew, standing right in front of me. He wasn't leering at me or anything, he was just smiling. I gave him an awkward greeting, expecting him to move out of my way, but he didn't. He just let a few more awkward seconds tick by before saying, Sorry, I was just waiting for you to finish. I told him it was fine, even though it bloody well wasn't, then he finally stepped out of my way and let me pass. God knows how long that he was standing out there just listening to me or whatever. We generally operated a, if the bathroom door is closed, it's in use policy too, so I know something wasn't right about him, just standing out there silently. That was a really rough night if I'm being honest. I thought I'd found my dream set up for my final year and I thought Andrew was this wholesome, dedicated husband who wouldn't dream of making me uncomfortable. It wasn't a complete disaster if he turned out to be a bit of a creep, but it was just really disappointing, I suppose. Andrew went back to his best behavior for about a week after that, but just as I was starting to think that the whole bathroom thing had been a hideous misunderstanding, things escalated considerably. One night at about three in the morning, I get a phone call from one of my old flatmates. She was out drinking, there had been an incident with a boy, and she was both very drunk and very upset. I stayed up to talk to her for a few minutes, made sure that she was in a taxi on her way home, and then told her that I'd call her again in the morning. After that, I hung up and realized that I needed to nip to the toilet before heading back to bed. I rolled out of bed, put my very fluffy robe on, and then crept towards my bedroom door to open it, only to find that it was already open. I always close my door at night, always, especially after the whole bathroom run-in when I started to feel like Andrew's interest in me was less than wholesome. But then that night, my door was ever so slightly ajar. My heart started to pound as I realized someone had been watching me sleep, and me rolling over to answer my friend's call had been the thing to scare them off. If I'd stayed asleep, I imagined that they'd have just quietly closed my door again, but since I was awake, the sound of it suddenly closing would have most definitely alerted me to their presence. That whole thought chain that went through my head at a mile a minute, and suddenly, I didn't feel so much like going for a wee anymore. The darkness in the hallway outside terrified me, so I just closed my door, got back into bed, and tried my best to go back to sleep. I woke up tired, anxious, and bursting to pee, and my morning didn't get much better after that. I met up with the friend that I told you about, the one having boy trouble, and I got about five minutes into a conversation with her before I just broke. I tried my best to hold back the tears, with us being in public and all, but it was so hard. I was heartbroken, exhausted. I didn't even want to go back to the place I'd once been head over heels in love with. Now I know this might sound like a major first world problem to some people. Oh, a man made me feel uncomfortable, woe is me, but look at it from my perspective. There was a progression to it, this sort of slow escalation, and if I didn't do something about it, it was bound to get worse. I ended up talking the whole thing out with her over a few cups of tea back at her place, and we hashed out a sort of plan. If I really loved that place as much as I said it, and I didn't want to let Andrew's creepy behavior force me out, I had to get a lock on my door. Jen and Andrew hadn't thought to have one fitted, and I had a feeling that asking for one might get a bit awkward, but if I wanted to be safe while staying there, I needed to ask about one. I can also hear you practically screaming at your devices, saying, why didn't you move out as soon as you realized you were in danger? Well. I didn't actually think that I was in any actual danger. Having my privacy invaded, yes, in a big way. But did I think that there was a serious threat to my life? Not really. I wouldn't be seeing Andrew in quite the same light again, but I knew all I needed to do was get a lock and potentially warn Jen about her husband's behavior, and that might well resolve the issue. There's also the third factor that has kept me from just packing up all my stuff and just getting the bloody hell out of there. If I was a first year with time to play with, then yeah, maybe I'd have done just that. But this was my third year, 
the most crucial of my degrees, so couch surfing and looking for a new place would eat into my study time, ruin my focus, and potentially jeopardize my whole degree. I was stuck between a rock and a hard place, so I weighed up my options and I decided that staying at the cottage would be my best bet. When I raised the prospect of a lock on my door with Jen, it was just as awkward as I had imagined, but also the most British kind of awkward imaginable. I caught her on a weekend, asked her very politely, and she said yes right away. I actually thought the awkwardness was averted, but as I was walking away, Jen was like, Is everything okay? I just didn't know how to address the issue there and then, knowing that it amounted to accusing her husband of slowly escalating harassment, so I didn't. I just said yes, everything was fine. It's just that the whole lock thing had been on my mind for a while and I wanted to ask if it was okay. It was obviously going to be their kids room at some point so a lock wouldn't be needed, but she agreed that they could simply remove it when the time came. I told her everything was okay, but I know that she didn't believe me, not 100% anyways. If I trusted them completely, if nothing was happening to make me feel uncomfortable, then I wouldn't be asking for one and she knew that as well as I did. I was actually a bit worried that she'd just ask Andrew to do it, in which case he'd know that I'd try to go behind his back with my request. But she didn't. She said that she'd get a handyman to do it since she and Andrew were both so busy with work. Now a few days go by and I hear nothing back about the lock, and then after a week, I decided to give Jen a nudge about it. She apologized, told me that it had completely slipped her mind, and promised to get on it as soon as possible. But that didn't do anything for me, not really, because the same pattern of behavior was due to repeat itself. And in case he hadn't noticed, Andrew would do something, or something weird would happen with my room or belongings, and then he'd back off for a little while as if his compulsion was satisfied. Around the time I reminded Jen about the lock, Andrew had been quiet for a while, and since I was due an incident, I decided to employ one of the tactics my friend and I had talked about. We'd thrown around the idea of getting like a little miniature camera, a nanny cam as they're called sometimes, as a way of catching Andrew in the act. A piece of tech like that was way beyond my very humble student budget, but then we realized that I already had a piece of surveillance equipment, or rather, something which would be easily made as a sort of ad hoc surveillance device. My laptop... I just had to keep it open and facing the door, maybe with a sort of sleep mode or black screen app to make it look switched off and then just record a very long video using Windows Movie Maker or something. It would take up a lot of memory, and the picture might not be the best, but it was a solid enough plan to be put into action and so that's what I did. Day after day, night after night, I secretly recorded my room whenever I was out or asleep. I hadn't really considered how much work it was going to be. Sifting through video files that were anything from 7 to 10 hours long. And if it was what I needed to do before the lock was fitted, so be it. I was definitely ready to move out at that stage. Watching all that video was eating into my study time, but... And I know this might sound so lovey or naive. I felt a responsibility to Jen now. If her husband wasn't who she thought he was, and I just packed up and left her with him without even so much as a warning... What kind of person would that make me? I remember getting a text from her at the start of the week telling me that a handyman would be out on the Thursday to fit the lock. It was such a huge relief, but I also reckoned that I'd keep on secretly filming until then. And as much as I wanted to say that I'm glad that I kept it up, I don't think that I can mean it wholeheartedly. On the Wednesday, the day before the handyman was due to fit the lock, I arrived back from uni and got to time skipping through my ad hoc CCTV footage. I was so used to seeing absolutely nothing that when I skipped a one time marker and saw a figure in my room, I honestly recoiled a little bit in fright. It was, you guessed it, Andrew. I had had a bloody good idea that he'd been sneaking around my room but to actually see it happening right there in front of me, I felt this kind of skin crawling nausea the likes of which I'd never felt before. At first, he just stood there, careful not to touch anything, just sort of looking around. I'm not claiming to be a psychic or anything, but it was like I could hear his thoughts. He'd obviously been told about the handyman fitting the lock, even if it was very late and in passing, 
and he wanted to make the most of his one final chance to snoop around my room before I had it under lock and key. He made it way over to this cork board that I had hanging from the one wall. Over the previous two years, I'd filled it with all kinds of pictures of me and my friends. Friends from uni, friends from back in Shrewsbury, printouts and Polaroids and passport-sized pictures, a chaotic collage of memories and friends both old and new. Andrew crept up to it, looked at it for a few minutes, and then reached up to pluck one of the smaller passport-sized pictures from one overpopulated corner. I was furious, extremely creeped out, but absolutely livid too. Only, Andrew wasn't done yet. Photo in hand, he walked over to my bed and laid on it. Not on his back, but in a kind of rough fetal position facing away from the camera. He stayed there long enough for me to think that he was sleeping, but then I saw him move. It was gentle at first, barely could see it at all, until you could quite clearly see him shaking, almost like he was sobbing, but I don't even know how to say this, more sustained maybe? I couldn't work out exactly what he was doing, but he stayed like that for a few minutes. I know what you're thinking, but if he was doing that, then he certainly didn't leave any trace of it. When he finished, he just got up, straightened out my sheets, and then left with the stolen picture. I finally had him on camera, sneaking around my room, acting like a lunatic and stealing my things. Not exactly crime of the century or anything, but now I could quite literally show Jen the kind of guy her husband really was. Now granted, doing so would be quite an intrusive act that might well destroy their marriage, but women have got to look out for each other, right? At least, that's what I was taught growing up. I didn't really dilly-dally over it, and I didn't let my new door lock put me off finally doing the right thing either. I waited until we could sit down together and have a proper chat, and then broke it to her as gently as possible. As I imagined, she was initially quite offended at such an accusation, but we'd known each other for months by this point, and she knew that I wouldn't make up some wild claim out of hand. Naturally, she wanted to see the evidence, just to know for certain that what I was saying was true, and when she watched the video clip I had isolated exactly for her, I could see that she turned pale. And when the clip was over, Jenny apologized profusely to me, told me that she'd make things right, and then declared very grimly, I might add, I think I've got a phone call to make. I knew that they'd be some of the most difficult phone calls of her life, so I went for a walk to give her a bit of privacy. And when I got back, she caught me in the hallway, and tears were still streaking down her face, and told me Andrew was going to find somewhere else to live for a while. I cried a bit too as I gave her a hug. I kind of felt like her little sister, you know, and for the next week or so, I tried to be there for her as best I could. But ultimately, Jen just wanted to be alone. Just over a week later, I came home from university to find that Jen was home early. She said that she'd taken a mental health day at work and had come home at lunchtime to put the Christmas decorations up. But when she got back, she didn't really much feel like decorating. I asked if she'd spoken to Andrew, and she had, but she didn't want to talk about it. She said that she couldn't really think about it without breaking down into tears, and there had been enough drama dumping on me for the time being. I told her that I'd be up in my room if she needed me, for anything, even if it was just a talk. And she thanked me and I walked out into the hallway and up the stairs. I'd only been up in my room for a few minutes when my phone started to buzz. And it was a text from Jen saying, cup of tea with a question mark. We'd taken to communicating like that sometimes. Very first world of us, I know, but it saved her walking up the two flights of stairs. I texted her back saying love one and then got down to studying like I used to before all the horribleness had started. A few minutes later, Jen showed up with my tea and then I got back to studying. Maybe 35 to 40 minutes later, I started to feel tired. Not just that usual later afternoon sluggishness either, I mean really lethargic. I drank the rest of the tea in gulps, hoping the little caffeine boost would see me through until the evening, but then just minutes later, I felt the exhaustion hit me like a brick wall and I could barely keep my eyes open. I kept a few blister packs of Pro Plus in my desk drawer, little caffeine pills that I used to take to pull all-nighters, and as I'm rummaging around looking for them, 
there's a knock on my door. It was Jen, wanting to know if I was feeling okay. She never came to my room like that, and there was something in the way that she looked at me that just seemed really out of character. It was like there was a question behind the question, and in a sudden moment of absolute horror, I realized what that question was. I tried to seem as awake as possible and told her, yeah, that I was actually thinking about going out with a few friends of mine for a bit. She forced a smile and then just sort of left me there alone. I dry swallowed about four of those caffeine pills and then called the friend who had the boy trouble from earlier that I mentioned, and I just said something like, I think they drugged me. Please come and pick me up. Call an ambulance if I stop texting back. I couldn't believe that I was texting someone those actual words. I even thought maybe I was being kind of paranoid. Never in a million years when I first moved in did I think that it'd eventually come to something like that. Texting out an SOS, scared for my life, feeling completely and utterly betrayed by the one person I thought that I could trust. It was, and still remains, the worst night of my life. I made myself throw up to try and get whatever was left of that tainted tea out of me, but my friend still drove me to the A&E when she arrived to pick me up. I was kept in hospital overnight and the nurses monitored my condition, but whatever I'd been given just made me sleep for almost 14 hours straight. And in that time, my friend had been in touch with the police to find out what kind of legal action I could actually take. But the sad fact was, unless I was tested right after I was brought into hospital, there was very little they could do. To test my blood or urine, they needed my consent, and for that, they'd need to be able to wake me up. And thanks to whatever Jen had slipped into my tea, I was basically dead to the world until early the following morning. I could still make a complaint and the police would have a word with Jen to make sure that she had nothing untoward to tell them about Andrew, or maybe even me for that matter. And then this is the part that still gets me the most. When the police arrived to talk to Jen, guess who was there with her? Like nothing had ever happened. Yeah, Andrew. They confirmed that yes, there had been a bit of a tiff, and Andrew had been staying with his parents over the weekend, but... Nothing I'd said was true. In fact, according to them, I'd been a complete pain in the butt from the start to finish, and they have suspected of me being involved in a burglary that they'd been subjected to because one of the things that had gone missing was, you guessed it, my laptop. The same laptop containing the only piece of evidence that anything remotely weird had happened in the first place. I went ahead with the blood and urine test just in case they'd pick anything up, but I had to wait weeks to get a negative result back, and by that time, I was living in an emergency accommodation provided by the university. The police said that that didn't mean that I wasn't drugged or spiked, as a lot of sedatives are out of your system in, I guess, 12 hours or so. It just meant that I pretty much had no legal recourse, as it was now just a case of he said, she said. My dad had driven over to help me get my stuff back, and funny enough, Andrew hadn't been present during the exchange, and... All my stuff was boxed up outside, so no actual contact had to be made. My dad had wanted to give Jen and Andrew a piece of his mind, but it's not surprising that they didn't fancy anything like that. I think by the time I had gotten my stuff back, I was just happy to have closed such a nightmarish chapter in my entire life. I had totally resigned myself to police being no help whatsoever. I know it's not their fault. The fault lay in constraints in the law, so... I just moved on and forgot about it ever happening, and I hope I never ran into them anywhere ever again. I try not to think about what would have happened if I'd given in and taken a nap that day or, or if I hadn't caught on to what was going on. I could handle knowing Andrew was some kind of closeted pervert, but thinking his wife was in on it and was about to sell me up the river for lying through her teeth for weeks. Like I said, after all that chaos and insanity, it just isn't worth thinking about. If you enjoyed this scary story, listen to thousands more, either over on the Let's Read YouTube channel or podcast.